You guys probably didn't notice because it's barely being talked about at all in the news, but there's an election coming up this year. Not just in America, actually, but like everywhere. According to a blog post from ProtonVPN, over 60 countries around the world this year are holding national elections in some form or fashion, which equals about 40 billion people or nearly half of everyone on Earth. Good job, democracy. And being a privacy and security project, the new oil would be remiss if we didn't talk about that. Because as veteran viewers know, privacy is a critical component of democracy. So in this video, I wanna talk about the intersection of privacy, cybersecurity, and democracy, and some steps you can take to protect yourself while still being politically involved. Before I dive in, I should make a few important disclaimers. First off, I am not a lawyer. I'm not even a voting law expert. I did work for an elections office for about a year, and I don't mean like a specific political party. I worked for the actual nonpartisan government agency who oversaw the election process itself and counted votes and ensured integrity and stuff like that. But that was many years ago, and I was an entry-level employee, so while I do know more about the nuts and bolts of the process than the average person, there's also whole books with even more information that I don't know. So be sure to do your own research, and that includes contacting your local elections office with any locally specific questions before taking any of my advice. And on that note, as an American, most of what I know kind of only pertains to America. Now, I'm sure there's some overlap with other countries, especially Western democratic ones, but not everything is gonna be one-to-one, -one, so please keep that in mind. There are a million ways to approach this topic. Originally, when I started writing the script, I was gonna start by talking about all the ways that data is collected and how it can be abused and how to protect it, but this topic is really complicated and messy, and believe it or not, I was having a really hard time making a coherent linear story out of it. So instead, I decided to just split it up into four sections. We're gonna start at the most broad, basic level and get a little bit more granular as we go. In part one, I'm gonna talk about why privacy broadly matters for democracy in general, and some of the very specific, very real threats that we're facing these days. In parts two and three, we'll talk about the voting process and some ways that you can protect yourself from political pressure, both from online manipulation and from real world threats. And finally, in part four, we'll talk about peaceful protesting and how to keep yourself from getting put on a list for exercising your constitutional rights in a lawful and peaceful way. Most of us can probably fairly easily draw a line in our heads between privacy and democracy. Broadly speaking, privacy is what allows people to feel safe casting their vote without social or political pressure. It's what allows people to ask questions and explore new ideas that differ from their existing ones without fear of being outcast simply for asking questions, even if they turn out to be stupid questions. It also encourages people to express their voice and protest, lobby, or campaign for change without fear of retribution. We actually saw an example of this. Back in 2016, a research paper was published showing a 20% decrease in page views for terrorism-related topics on Wikipedia after the Snowden revelations. This suggested that people were afraid to educate themselves now that they knew that showing any sort of interest in the topic might put them on a list. This is far from the only example. Numerous studies over the years have proven this hypothesis again and again. If you're watching this and you can't relate to this feeling of concern, congratulations! You live in a safe and free area or you're part of the group who's in charge and you have nothing to fear because your ideas are the dominant ones. Around the world, a lot of people aren't so lucky. Many people are expected to vote a certain way, either by the government in power or by their communities. Even in places where the elections are provably outright rigged, showing any kind of dissent can be a great way to land yourself on a list and get harassed by the government or ostracized by the people around you. Even here in the West, there are areas that are so politically and culturally homogenous that being different could have a number of risks, from simply being socially ostracized to straight up violence. It's easy to take it for granted because it's kind of the norm for us Americans, or at least it has been so far, but the ability to have a peaceful and legitimate political process from protesting, campaigning, voting, and even the peaceful transfer of power is something really unique that we should all appreciate and try to protect. I don't wanna sound like a paranoid alarmist here, but now more than ever, we really need to appreciate and protect this. I am not a political science expert, but it really feels like things are on a little bit of a precipice here. Maybe I'm being brainwashed by an alarmist media or something, but in the past couple of years, I've read numerous articles and nonfiction books citing studies that show a number of concerning trends, from increased and widening political division between everyday citizens, as well as the parties themselves, to a rise in violent rhetoric from both sides of the political aisle, as well as several notable cases of political violence, again, here in the West. We can't get complacent and think that problems that other countries face can't happen here, because we already saw with the overturn of Roe versus Wade in 2022 that anything can change overnight, and believe it or not, some of those threats already exist here. Now, to be fair and keep some perspective, the raw numbers for political violence here in America are low at the time of this recording. Like, double digits low. That means that for many people watching this, political violence, officially sanctioned or otherwise, is currently more of a boogeyman or a hypothetical than an actual risk. 
But that's right now. Like I said, you never know what the future holds. And if you're one of those people who has zero fear putting a political sticker on your car or a sign on your lawn, hey, that's fantastic. However, some people have valid concerns for wanting to keep their opinions to themselves. Whether the threat is real or perceived, some people may simply feel more comfortable expressing their opinions and exploring their ideologies in a quiet, individual manner where they don't have to tell the world who they voted for or where they stand on a specific issue. And while I applaud people who are willing to be visible on behalf of others, everyone should absolutely have that right and freedom to keep their ideas to themselves if they want. That's kind of the definition of privacy. Now, before we begin, it's important to define a threat model. In this section, I'm assuming that your enemy isn't targeting you specifically, but that you are at risk of being caught up in their net. So this can include things like targeted advertising, troll farms, propaganda, aka fake news, and more. In the next section, I'll discuss targeted attacks against you, which could include online attacks such as doxing and swatting, but for now, I'm going to focus broadly on the massive, at-scale threats facing all of us online. Now, I'm not going to waste my breath trying to convince viewers that fake news is a real problem. Either you believe me, or you've got your head in the sand. For those who are a little fuzzy on exactly how this works and how the suggestions I'm about to make here will help you, we first need to explain how targeted advertising and algorithmic timelines have been instrumental in the rise of online propaganda. To make a long and convoluted story misleadingly short and oversimplified, it all started with targeted advertising. When you buy an online ad, you usually pay either per number of people who see your ad or per number of people who click on your ad. As a result, in a perfect world, the goal is to only ever show your ad to people who are going to buy your product, otherwise, you're wasting money. That's where we as a society came up with this idea of using collected data for targeted advertising. If Widget Corp is trying to sell a DVD box set of famous serial killers throughout history, it really helps them if they know that I'm a true crime fan and you're not. They can avoid showing you the ad and instead show it to me, who's way more likely to buy it than you. And the more data they collect, the more effectively they can target this ad. For example, if they know that I tend to watch horror movies at night, they can show that ad to me at night, where I'm more likely to be looking for my next thriller to watch. This eventually bled over into the algorithmic timeline, aka why you don't see posts in order on Facebook or Twitter, as well as crap from people in pages that you don't follow, and why you sometimes don't see the stuff you wanted to see when you followed that person or page in the first place. Companies are trying to show people ads, but only certain people at certain times, which means that if more people spend more time on a platform, the platform has more opportunities to show the users more ads for more companies at the optimal time, making the companies more likely to keep buying ad space if the targeting is effective. This is what led companies to using the same data that they had amassed for advertising to curate your experience and show you stuff that was most likely to keep you on the platform. And this is how we have trending videos, trending topics, and the now infamous YouTube rabbit hole. This is also where fake news comes in. Since all the platform cares about is keeping you on the site, they are happy to show you anything that will keep you there, even if it's just for a few more minutes, whether it's good for you or not, whether it's true or not, whether it makes you feel better or not. Companies promote whatever gets people to react and spend time on the platform. And thus, with a careful mix of ad space, clickbaity stories that seem believable by only telling half-truths, if that much, and the occasional handful of bot farms to game the engagement algorithm, it really doesn't take much for a skilled operator to very quickly spread a false story that claims a politician said something they didn't, or to make a series of coincidences seem like a conspiracy, or to make two people believe very different versions of the same event. So with that process in mind, let's talk about how to defend against this threat. First off, the easiest defense is to just not play the game. At least one study has found that people who spend less time on platforms like Facebook feel happier and are less politically polarized. While numerous other researchers have noticed a correlation between the sharp rise of social media and screen time among teenagers with problems like depression, anxiety, and self-harm. Now, in the interest of fairness, we should note that correlation doesn't equal causation, but the correlation is shockingly high. And personally, I'm convinced that at very least it plays a large role. Now, I understand that for a lot of people, it's a tall order to ask them to simply not engage online at all. For better or worse, social media is here to stay, and it does have some redeeming qualities. I do think, however, that it's very reasonable to ask people to rethink their relationships with technology. And this is where we start to defend against the data collection that's being weaponized against us. In his seminal book, Digital Minimalism, which I cannot recommend enough, by the way, Cal Newport shares a variety of techniques and tools that can help you take charge of your tech usage again instead of letting it take charge of you. Things like using apps and browser extensions that force you to only spend an hour per day on a specific app or to remove your Facebook newsfeed so that you don't get distracted while checking for messages or group updates. 
Alongside such advice, I also advocate for things like removing the app off your phone entirely so that you won't be tempted to check it when you're standing in line at the coffee shop or disabling notifications so that you don't feel that Pavlovian need to respond immediately for things that probably aren't that important. The vast majority of apps like social media or email really aren't that time sensitive. They can wait. One thing that Newport recommends is carrying around a small book that fits in your pocket or your bag, or I would recommend listening to an audiobook from your local library, which is free by the way, or discover a new podcast, like Surveillance Report. That actually ties into some of my advice here in a second. Additionally, the new oil is full of tools that can help protect your privacy in mind-blowingly easy ways. The beautiful thing about trying to protect yourself from mass surveillance like this is that it's surprisingly easy to make a big impact. Since most people aren't doing it, it's not really worth it for companies to aggressively hunt down the handful of people who are. This means that relatively simple techniques can go a long way toward protecting you. This includes things like switching to a privacy-respecting browser such as Brave or Firefox with uBlock Origin, which, by default, blocks a significant number of ads and trackers. If you're more tech-savvy, you can switch your DNS resolver on your device or your router to block even more stuff on other devices like smart TVs or gaming consoles. You can switch your search engine from one like Google, who tracks every search query you make and ties it back to you for advertising purposes, to one like Brave or Mojik, who doesn't. And don't even get me started on phones. Your phone's default settings are a mess. And by removing apps that you don't need and adjusting some of your settings, you can really go a long way toward making your phone a little bit more private. Finally, you should simply be careful what you do online. If you do use social media, be mindful of the kind of pages you follow, like politicians or even political satire accounts or political movement pages. Be mindful of the posts you share and even the content you upload, like photos, check-ins, and status updates. All this data is collected and used to build that profile of you that advertisers and algorithms use to serve you new content. And even stuff that seems non-political when enough of it is collected can actually be used to infer some pretty accurate information about you that you may not even know you're revealing. Now I do want to address a really big problem that comes with disconnecting like this is staying informed. Social media is a great way to stay informed, even if the news you get isn't always accurate. I tackled this very subject in a blog post once where I offered several possible solutions, such as newsletters, podcasts, my personal favorite is RSS, or even privacy respecting social media like Mastodon and Lemmy. These services don't use algorithmic timelines, and the drawback means that you're gonna have to put in some work and seek out the kinds of news you wanna follow. It's not gonna be fed to you. But once you get settled in and you start following the right accounts, this is a great way to stay informed. And as a bonus, it gives you an opportunity to break out of any potential echo chambers you may have unwittingly become trapped in. Now, it's really critical to note that everything I shared here is very quick, broad strokes. None of this will 100% stop data collection or make you anonymous or ensure that you never ingest any fake news again. This is a serious societal problem. It's pervasive, and even using these very techniques, you have to constantly exercise critical thinking and due diligence. However, in that Stanford study I cited earlier, they said that it only took three days for participants to feel less politically polarized. Once you start to purge a lot of this low-hanging fruit and filling your feed with more nuanced, high-quality sources, you'll not only be more informed, but also more knowledgeable and ready to participate more meaningfully in the complex issues that are facing us today. All right, as we enter into this next section, we have to redefine our threat model for the different threats facing us. In this section, our threat model is other private citizens who might dislike your political views and try to intimidate or harm you because of them. In this scenario, I'm assuming that you are not politically overt. In other words, you're not like attending protests or making speeches at rallies. You're just kind of going about your daily life, voting, maybe signing the occasional petition, and maybe having discussions with people that you trust while trying to stay informed and educated on the issues. Unlike the last section, in this situation, the threat is much more targeted and aimed at you. Maybe it was a hashtag you used online or a post you shared, or maybe a crazy person just moved in next door. Who knows? Before we dive in, I want to acknowledge that one of the biggest things you can do to protect yourself from a threat model like this is to avoid becoming a target in the first place. Like I said, don't post memes, don't follow politicians on social media, don't even have discussions with people that you trust, etc. If that's the case, then the only thing you really have to worry about is data breaches. I did mention a little bit in the previous section that I do advocate for being cautious about your online presence, but I also want to take a second to acknowledge that that's not really fair or realistic to ask of everyone. Again, if you're the kind of person who's comfortable with avoiding politics, at least outwardly, it's definitely the safest way to go. But like I said at the beginning, there is something to be said for being part of the public discourse, especially when it comes to helping stand up for marginalized people, calling attention to underrepresented issues, and other stuff like that. 
It's really not fair to say everyone should just stop talking about political issues publicly. Aside from the argument that everything is political, without healthy discussion and exchange of ideas, the extremism, division, and polarization defining our modern era are only going to get worse, and society can never progress. So with that in mind, yes, the safest way to protect yourself from political backlash of any kind is to not be political at all, especially outwardly. But again, that's not fair to people who want to express their views and those who benefit from those people. Given that context, the most important things you'll want to protect are your home address and your contact information. The reason to protect your home address is, I think, pretty obvious. That's where people can come harass you and your family and make you feel unsafe. Your contact information also matters here because people can spam you, send you threats, or otherwise harass and disrupt your day. They can also use certain info, like email address and phone number, to find other online presences on various services, where they can then further harass you. Or they might be able to find out more information to target you, like family members or where you work. I think the easiest attack surface to protect here is your public data on people search websites. Data brokers already publish an alarming amount of sensitive data, like phone number, full name, address, and date of birth. Some of them even publish your political party if you registered one on your voter information, which is required to vote in primary elections in states with closed primaries. People search sites like these are among the first sources that someone wishing to dox or intimidate you will check. These sites regularly draw information from a significant number of resources, like public records, including voter records, social media, and more. So it's really important to be careful what you put out there. Now, don't freak out if this sounds like a lot. I'm going to go over most of this stuff one by one. Keeping your address and contact information off people search sites is very doable, but it will require being proactive on your end. Once your address is out there and people start showing up at your door or texting you, you kind of don't have a lot of options but to move. First off, I have a page about people search sites. This talks about several data removal services that can help keep your information off of those websites. Because this data tends to just come back because they just scrape the sources again, these services are a recurring subscription that will regularly purge this data for you. In the past, I've done a handful of videos about data brokers and people search sites, and I talk about some of the differences in these services to keep in mind when you're picking one, as well as some more advanced strategies that you can use to prevent the data from getting there in the first place. But again, this is going to require some work, and it may not be the right threat model for everyone. To protect your contact information, I recommend making use of email aliasing and voice over IP, or VoIP. If you're not familiar with those services, I have videos about both of those topics here and here. I briefly mentioned it before, but if you're using the same email or phone number across multiple websites, there's actually other services that people can go to to find your accounts by putting in that email or phone number. And then again, they can use those accounts to glean more information about you or just further harass you. As an added bonus, if you use multiple email addresses and phone numbers and one of them does become compromised like this, it's a lot less disruptive to just shut it down and migrate to a new one, as opposed to if you had one single email address or phone number and you had to change it literally everywhere. Using these services will allow you to easily and conveniently manage multiple phone numbers and email addresses to protect yourself without a lot of headache. I also recommend the use of disinformation to help pollute the information that people search websites do collect about you and possibly make it harder for would-be doxers to find accurate information about you. The more time of theirs you can waste sending them on a wild goose chase in the wrong direction, the more likely they are to eventually just give up. While aliasing and disinformation are valuable tools in your toolkit, in some cases, like voting information specifically, there's important stuff you simply can't, or shouldn't at least, lie about. For example, when you register to vote, it requires your home address, and that makes sense. I do not want people who don't live in my area having a say in things that affect me but not them. In some cases, an address change as simple as moving across the street could be enough to put you in a different district for voting purposes and result in a completely different ballot. The best advice I have here is to ask your local election office if they offer a way to not publish your information online. Many states do have a form that you can just fill out for free, but they don't readily broadcast that. This won't prevent your information from being handed over to someone who comes down in person or from being caught up in a data breach, but it will keep someone from looking you up online and from people search sites that simply scrape the data. In the last section, I made the assumption that you're not politically active, but it's worth noting that if you are politically active, everything I've said before, especially about like public data removal and protection, still forms an important foundation for protecting yourself. That's because in this section, we're going to kick it up a notch. Bam! We're going to talk about being an activist, specifically a peaceful protester. In this section, your adversary includes a government, usually local, but maybe bigger. Now, government adversaries are an extreme level, and this deserves an entire video. No, 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 an entire website. This is a topic I don't talk about much, because honestly, there's a massive range of possible threats and defenses here, and the stakes for getting it wrong are just too high. 
On the more extreme end of the spectrum, you have to assume that you're being physically followed everywhere, that your mail is being intercepted, that your home might be bugged, and that your devices might be compromised. To be 100% honest, this is a situation that very, very few people watching this will fall into. And again, it's a topic that's so complex and nuanced with so many different possible defenses and you have to make sure you get it right that I don't feel comfortable handing out broad advice like I normally do. Even if you are in a situation where you have a highly advanced, well-resourced and dedicated attacker, that alone could describe a political activist, a domestic abuse survivor, a celebrity being stalked, and plenty of other situations where the resources available to you are vastly different, and the consequences could range from imprisonment to torture or even fatal harm. It would be criminally irresponsible of me, no pun intended, to be issuing blanket advice with that kind of a situation without consulting with the individual person, especially when the consequences can be literally deadly. If I'm wrong about my usual advice, you get a few targeted ads. If I'm wrong about this, you f***ing die. That's a situation where I need to know a lot about you specifically, your specific situation, your specific threats, resources, assets, etc. The best blanket advice I can give is that you should use something like Tor, Tails, or Hoonix to do more research on your specific situation, and if your situation is extreme enough and resources allow, you should probably contact some experts like Michael Basil, Eva Galperin, or any number of organizations out there who have the knowledge and resources to offer you the most up-to-date and meaningful advice for, again, your situation. That's a really tough spot to be in though, and my heart genuinely goes out to you. Getting back to this video though, for this last section, I'm gonna be talking about attending a peaceful protest. To the critics in the audience, this is not about how to loot a target and get away with it, or burn down a car and be anonymous. In fact, if things start to get violent, I highly recommend you split immediately to avoid getting wrongfully caught up in that or harmed. No, this is advice about how to attend a peaceful demonstration without ending up on a list because you're a potential rabble rouser. And for the record, that's an actual term the FBI used back in the 60s and 70s when they were illegally spying on members of the civil rights movement, kind of like nowadays. The man doesn't really take kindly to people who challenge the status quo, whether it's justified or not, and hence why I want to address this. The right to freedom of assembly is promised not only in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, but also in Article 15 of the American Convention of Human Rights and Article 20 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Though it should be noted that the U.S. has not ratified the second one, and that while we did vote in favor of the third one, it's not legally binding, and therefore it's more like a motivational poster than an actual law. Millions of people around the world protest every single year, with over 5.4 million Americans alone in a 10-month window of 2017. This is a perfectly valid form of activism, and to me it is unacceptable that you might end up getting extra scrutiny because you took part in it. So in this scenario, I'm assuming a threat model where you showed up to a peaceful, lawful protest as part of the crowd to show your support, and we're going to try and avoid having automated systems like facial recognition and IMSI catchers identify you and add you to a database of persons of interest. I'm gonna go a little fast because there's a lot to cover here, so feel free to consult my recent blog post on this topic if I go too fast. It covers everything here and a lot more. So starting at the top, most of us will likely use social media as our main way of discovering an upcoming event. In addition to all the advice I've already offered, like deleting social media accounts if you don't really need them, keeping the apps off your phone, and being careful what you post, I recommend that you don't actually mark yourself as attending the protest. Several years ago, law enforcement was accused of using Facebook check-ins to target protesters. Now, I don't know if this claim was ever proven or not, of course the cops denied it, but it doesn't take a warrant to check a public list of attendees on a website. So instead, mark your encrypted calendar and maybe check the event once in a while leading up to it for any updates. Getting to a protest also has risks of being identified. Protests typically take place at locations that are politically relevant and heavily monitored, like a Capitol building or a police station. If you're in a large city, like the Capitol usually is, you'd pretty much guarantee that the city is using automatic license plate readers to track your vehicle as you travel around in real time. There's also other threats that I'm not gonna get into here because of time, like CCTV and stingrays. I recommend visiting the EFF's Atlas of Surveillance to get a better picture of what known surveillance techniques exist in your specific area. Though you should be aware that it may not cover everything. I would recommend using public transit if possible. If you do have to drive or use a taxi or a rideshare app, I recommend arriving or parking near, but not at the location. One silver lining from the COVID-19 pandemic is that wearing face masks in public is not only acceptable, but it's relatively common, especially in large crowds like a protest. 
That's a great help, but it's not foolproof. Because of the rise in face masks, many facial recognition technologies were forced to learn how to identify faces with only a partial face visible so that, for example, people can still unlock their phones in public conveniently. I have it on good authority that the least suspicious yet most effective way to beat facial recognition is aviator sunglasses and a baseball cap. Though be aware that using this with a mask, unless it's a really sunny day out, may actually be kind of suspicious, so you may want to settle for like two out of three like a mask and sunglasses, or a hat and sunglasses, but no mask. If you choose to wear a hat, try to get your hands on a hat that doesn't actually reveal anything about you and is very common, such as a popular sports team in your area. If you have tattoos, wear long sleeves or clothing that covers them if it's not too hot out and again would look suspicious. Remove any identifiable jewelry like rings or earrings. Even your walk can give you away, though to be honest, I'm not sure how commonly gait recognition is deployed. I once read that the best defense to this is simply to wear baggy clothes. These will help obscure your gait, but keep in mind that if they're too baggy, it could also make it hard for you to get away quickly if something starts to go down. Which again, I do not recommend you stick around if things start to get out of hand. Now of course, cell phones are probably the biggest risk in a protest. On the one hand, having a phone can be a good thing. You can film anything that happens for objective documentation, you can call for help if something goes wrong, you can use rideshare apps. On the other hand, your phone can get broken, stolen, searched by the police, or used to identify that you were there through geolocation and other data. In a perfect world, the best strategy is to buy a cheap burner phone in cash. The easiest choice would be with Android, because you can avoid logging into an account during setup, and then you can use things like Aurora Store and F-Droid to download any apps that you need without the Play Store. If I were going this route, I would only download secure apps that I needed, like Signal to communicate with, maybe a cloud storage app like Proton or Filin to upload any photos or videos you take for safekeeping. It should be noted there are additional concerns there about how to be anonymous, so be sure you know what data is encrypted, what data is not encrypted, and what can be turned over with a court order. I would also recommend against downloading mainstream apps like Facebook or Google Drive because these companies are notorious for collecting location data. Again, even rideshare apps or transit apps, I would either delete them or go into the phone settings and disable their permissions after arrival, specifically location. I would also be sure to ditch the phone as soon as the protest is over. I mean, it's a burner, you don't need it anymore. Just be sure to factory reset it first. If you can't afford a burner phone, you could try using an old one you have lying around or get one from a friend, but in both of these cases, number one, be sure to factory reset it, and number two, be aware that technically there's still a link between that phone and the previous owner. So again, I cannot stress this enough, do not cause trouble that might make the police look extra close at you and find those links. If you're just using this device to peacefully show up and go home, you'll probably be fine. If you start causing trouble, they will dig for those links. If you have no choice but to use your phone, you can try removing as many apps and files as possible before attending. For example, you can make a backup and then reset your phone, and then after the protest, you can restore the backup. But again, what I just said a minute ago about there's a link there still applies. You could also try putting your phone in airplane mode or turning it off, but again, be aware there will be a record of when and where your phone was turned off. Again, I want to emphasize that in the aforementioned blog post, I dedicated like five paragraphs to cell phone strategies alone. This is just a really quick overview. Now it's important to know, all these strategies will make it harder, although not impossible, for people to remotely ID you based on your electronic footprint and to intercept the contents of your messages and your phone traffic. Even so, having a phone with anything on it, even just a cloud account or signal, means that you do still have some stuff that could identify you if someone were to unlock the device and look at the contents. So what are your rights if you get stopped and a cop asks to search your phone? I wanna remind everyone, I'm not a lawyer, but I've done quite a bit of research for this topic, and here's how I understand the current state of privacy laws regarding phones at the time this video is made. Arrest means that you are in police custody. They can place you in handcuffs, they can take you to jail, and other things. At this point, you do have a variety of rights, like you have the right to remain silent, you have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, you have the right to have one provided to you by the state, so on and so forth. You may or may not be entitled to phone calls. That one phone call thing is actually not like a hard and fast rule. Police are allowed to record that phone call unless it's to an attorney. Now you can be ordered to unlock a device like a phone or a computer with a court order, but you are not required to tell them the password. They are also allowed to legally confiscate your devices and simply attempt to hack them with things like Celebrite or Grey Key. Unfortunately, the best defense against this is to have a recent model iPhone or Pixel. 
But regardless of what kind of phone you have, if you get arrested, you should still restart it or turn it off before handing it over. This puts your phone in what's called before first unlock or BFU state, which is the most secure state a phone can be in because nothing has been unencrypted yet. Once you've unlocked the phone for the first time, certain data remains in the temporary memory in an unencrypted state, and it can be more vulnerable to the aforementioned hacking tools. Detainment means that you are not under arrest, but you are not free to leave. At this point in time, you are not entitled to an attorney provided by the state, but you are still entitled to stay silent, to have an attorney present if you have one, and to refuse a search without a warrant. Whether or not your devices are protected from search at this point is actually kind of a gray area with many conflicting rulings. You may decide to refuse to unlock your phone, however, be aware that that may risk being detained longer or escalating the situation to an arrest. It's also worth noting that there have been instances of police unlocking devices using Face ID without consent. Because of this, and because handing over your password or PIN is definitely not required ever, I recommend that prior to attending the protest, you replace your phone's biometric unlock with a strong PIN or password instead if you normally use biometrics. This will, at a bare minimum, protect your devices from non-consensual searches and abuse. In general, whether you're detained, arrested, or none of the above, you are never required to answer any questions without an attorney present. You are never required to tell the police any passwords to unlock your phone, computer, tablet, or any device. Keep in mind that police are allowed to confiscate your device and copy the data, so always remember to reboot it before handing it over. In my experience, I recommend you cooperate to a reasonable extent. I would answer questions like who you are, I would hand over an ID, and maybe say why you attended today. If you start to feel uncomfortable or the questions start getting really specific and accusatory, definitely stop talking and request an attorney. There are lots of innocent people in jail because they thought that they had nothing to hide and they thought they were helping themselves by cooperating. Now again, it's really, really important. I want to reiterate, I am not a lawyer. That is the best information I have based on my research, and I've said everything in good faith, but the laws vary from place to place, and I don't have any legal background whatsoever. If you have any questions, I encourage you to contact an actual lawyer. I also highly recommend EFF's Surveillance Self-Defense Portal, especially their article on attending protests. EFF is comprised of actual experienced lawyers, unlike me, so I would trust their judgment and information over whatever I said. I actually got a lot of the information in this video from there. Okay, that was a lot to cover. That actually was so long that my camera overheated and I had to take a break. <laughs> Especially that last section was a lot, which really just drives home what I said about how complicated it is to give advice to people with higher threat models. The more targeted and advanced the threats you face, the more work you're going to have to put into it. Now, I'm willing to bet that the vast majority of my viewers fall into the first two categories, where you're simply trying to protect yourself from propaganda and the random guy on Facebook who's mad that you didn't vote the way he wanted. And that's okay. The point of this video isn't to say that everyone needs to go out and attend a protest, although I certainly applaud anyone who has that kind of time, who decides to educate themselves and go cast their votes. Actually, that was probably the point, if anything. On a political note, here's how you can educate yourselves and cast your vote in a way where you stand the best chance of making up your own mind on the issues and safely being part of the democratic process. Remember what I said at the beginning, democracy is in a fragile spot right now, and we need to value it more than ever. We should make our voices heard peacefully, and a big part of that is having the privacy to explore, grow, educate ourselves, even if it's an uncomfortable topic, and cast our votes. Thank you so much for watching this video, and remember the information in the tech world changes fast, so please always check the website for the latest tools and techniques to protect your privacy, as well as my blog and podcast for the latest news and ideas, and if you want to support the channel, please check out the link below. We have affiliate links, we have recurring subscriptions, we have all kinds of ways that you can help. So thank you again for watching, and I will see you in the next video.